Okay, so I am going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so um, I do everything on a PowerPoint. So when you take notes, you can choose to just, you know, follow along and just watch, or you can take notes off of what I'm doing, or some people will just, you know, kind of listen and then they'll use the PowerPoint afterwards because I do email out the PowerPoint. So it's up to you how you want to take notes. And then, um, you know, if sometimes people are wondering, well, what if I come into the live late because this is recorded and I will email out the recording today, you can always review what we did so if there's something that you know later on you're like oh i remember we did this and i don't remember how to do it you can you can go back so um, i'll be sharing the recording and i will be sharing the powerpoint so um today i'm going over adding and subtracting fractions so if you are not yet aware and actually let me bring up one of our sections so i am teaching two sections of this class and let me just pull over. So if you're not aware, underneath the discussions here on the left, there's a link that says videos. So when you click on videos, they're organized by week. So you would go to week one videos. And then this is where I'm going to be putting all of the recordings. And then so these are existing videos. So I'm going over adding and subtracting fractions. And so I'm not going to go into detail on like prime factorization, reducing fractions um, or multiplying fractions because I already have videos on those things. So I'm gonna go through this video as if you have some knowledge of those things already. So that way I can focus just on the adding and subtracting. So if those parts are confusing for you. When we go through this, you can go to this area of the class and then review those areas. So I have videos on a whole bunch of things. There are tons of videos. So um, if the videos in Connect Math are not helpful, you can use these videos. Um, if you don't like to read the textbook, you can use these videos. Um, it's kind of up to you, but I've got videos on pretty much everything here. And this is like an overview video that goes over everything. So that's in the videos link right here. And that's where I will be putting the, um, all of the, the videos that I make. So just want to point that out to you. So I do want to start out here with just to, you know, talk about what a fraction is to remind you what a fraction is. So a fraction is a way that we use to um, express how many parts we have out of a whole. So like a fraction one half means you've got one part and two parts make up the whole. So if you had a pie split into two, then half of that would be one piece. So the top is always telling you the number of parts you have and the bottom is the whole, how many parts make up the whole thing. And the denominator, which is the bottom, never equals zero because we are not allowed to divide by zero. So you can have zero on top, which is called the numerator, but it can't be in the denominator. So in order to add and subtract fractions, we need to have what's called a common denominator. And we like to use the least common denominator. So this is abbreviated LCD. And it is the smallest number that all of your denominators can divide into evenly, meaning that there's no remainder, there's no decimal when you divide it. So if you have two denominators, your common denominator needs to be bigger than those two numbers. It is also known as the least common multiple of the denominators, which is abbreviated LCM. So you'll see both of those abbreviations or that terminology. So the common denominator is a number that's bigger than your denominators, but every denominator divides into it. So there are two ways to find the least common denominator. Uh, the first way is to use multiplication tables. So you basically create a multiplication table for every denominator that you have. 
and then you find the first number that they have in common, and that will be the smallest one. The other option is to do prime factorization. So that's why I pointed out that prime factorization video, um, because if you choose to do that method, that video may be very helpful for you. And what you do is you do the prime factorization for every denominator that you have, and then you take each number and the highest exponent when you're comparing the numbers, and then you multiply all those together and that will give you your common denominator. So I'm going to show, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate both of these. The third way to find the co common denominator is just to know your knowledge. If you know your times table in your head, you don't have to go through any of these methods and you can do it mentally. Um, but there are some that it's difficult to do mentally and you may have to do one of these methods. So we're going to just practice both of these methods so that you see what's going on here. So I've got two fractions, 17 over 12 and 29 over 30. So the denominator for the first one is 12 and the denominator for the second one is 30. So the least common denominator is the smallest number that both of those divide into. And mentally, I cannot do that in my head. I don't know what 12 and 30 both divide into because they're pretty large numbers. I can do my times tables, you know, up through tens, but those are bigger. I don't have those kind of things memorized. So this would be something that I would want to do one of these other methods. Of. So we'll start with the multiplication table method. And we're trying to find the common denominator, the number that 12 and 30 both go into or that they both can multiply to. As another, another way to think of it. So traditionally when you make multiplication tables, you may remember this way back from elementary school, you know, you would have times one, times two, times three. Usually they don't use the multiplication symbol. They just write the number up there and you're supposed to multiply it. So they would just put like four, five, and, and so on. And then you're multiplying. So we're gonna fill in this table and then we wanna find the first thing, set of numbers that they have in common. So we've already got times one because it's just the same number. So 12 times two is 24. So I'm gonna stick that in the uh, box that sort of, you know, has a row of 12 and a column of two. And then 30 times two is 60. So, so far we don't have any numbers that are in common. So I'm gonna move to the next column and you're basically doing row times column. 12 times three is 36. And then 30 times three is 90. So again, we don't have anything in common. So then I move to the next column. 12 times four is 48. 30 times four is 120. And nothing in common, so we move on again. 12 times five is 60. And we finally got a number that they both have in common. So I got 60 and we had gotten 60 with 30 all the way sort of at the beginning here. So we've got 60 and 60. Both numbers can divide into 60. So 12, it would be 12 times five gives you 60. And then it's 30 times two that gives you 60. So 60 is the first thing that we got in common by doing the multiplication table. And that means that is our least common denominator. So our least common denominator is equal to 60. So this is the multiplication method. Um, are there any questions on this method? No. Okay. No. So the alternate method is the prime factorization method. And um, so this involves making what's called a factor tree. 
you take each denominator and you keep splitting the number up into pairs of numbers that multiply to the number above it. So I'll start with 12 to demonstrate the, the factor tree. So I'm splitting it up into two numbers that multiply to 12. And there are multiple pairs. I could use six times two. I can do four times three. It doesn't matter. You'll get to the same result at the end, but I'm gonna do four times three. And if you get a prime number on that, you circle it. So three is prime because three can't be split up. But four is not. I can split four up as two times two. And then two is a prime number because it doesn't get split up. So that's my factor tree for 12. And then I do the same thing for 30. So just two numbers that multiply to 30, like five times six. Five can't be split up, but six is two times three. And then two and three can't be split up. So I've got my tree. You finish your tree when all the, the bottoms are circled, basically. All the branches end in a circled number. So the prime factorization of 12 can be written, what is this? These numbers can all be multiplied together to get to 12. So I can do two times two times three. And that is, there's two twos, so you can write that as an exponent, two squared times three. For 30, I can write that as two, oops, two times three times five, because those are the three circled numbers. And those don't get, you know, there's no, nothing that I can combine with the exponent there. And I rewrote it again because you want to line these up so that you're comparing the prime factorization for, for each thing. And then you're looking vertically. So vertically here where I have my line, I've got two squared and two. You always pick the number that has the highest exponent. So we're gonna have two squared. And then you go to the next column. I have three, so those are identical. I'm gonna just pick a three. And then I wanna have a five. So if you don't have the number in the first set, that's you have to take it from the second. And then this is going to form my least common denominator. So it's two squared times three times five. So it's four times three times five. And when you multiply those numbers together, that gives you 60. So we get the same number that we did through the multiplication table method. And this is what's called the prime factorization method. Are there questions on that method? No. Okay. Which method uh, do you guys prefer? <laughs> Out of these two, yeah. which ones do you like? I prefer the factor tree. You like the factor tree, okay. I actually like that too. That, that one I, I like. Um, anyone else have an opinion? That's totally okay. Okay, if nobody else has, <laughs> someone else likes the factor tree too. Yeah. Um, one reason why I like the factor tree is that it's the same method that you do if you're trying to reduce fractions. And it's um, the same kind of method that you would use if you're trying to factor, which is something that we'll do later on. Now we've got someone else here who likes the multiplication table. The multiplication table method is also used when we start looking for the greatest common factor. Both of these methods are used for greatest common factor, actually. Um, and multiplication table is used for when we're multiplying polynomials. So both of these methods come in handy later on in the class. So it really doesn't matter which one you use because both of them are helpful for things we will do down the road. So you guys can choose whichever one you want. They're both correct methods. 
you can do both if you want to double check. <laughs> So now that we've got the common denominator stuff out of the way, let's actually talk about how we add or subtract. And so we will refer to this as combining fractions together because you're, you've got multiple fractions and you're making them one fraction. So we are combining them. So these are the steps that you would use to do your addition or subtraction of um, fractions. Now, what I recommend when you're taking notes, and I have this specifically set up this way, it's, so I like to think of what we're learning with algebra is a series of recipes. You learn the steps on how to do something, and then you have a whole bunch of recipe cards and you combine those to make something else. So let's say you are making a birthday cake. You may have a recipe card on how to do the frosting, and then a card on how to make the cake itself. And then you, your actual final product uses both of those recipes. So a lot of what we do in algebra, you learn these steps, like you learn how to add fractions together. You learn how to multiply fractions. You learn these recipes and then you start pulling the recipe and using it to do something else. So we start to build steps upon existing steps. And this is why math is something that has to be done in order. So you have, you're going to want to do, you know, the weeks in order, the assignments in order, because if you skip out of order, you're missing an important piece of the recipe because you're missing important steps. Now, what I recommend people do is each time you get the directions, you get a recipe like this, you can put it on like an index card. So you have like your, a note card with the steps. So that way, when you're taking a quiz or you're working through the homework, all you have to do is shift through your note cards and find the right steps that you need. So that is just one recommendation that I make for taking notes. Um, you can also just have it in a sheet of paper wherever you want, but um, the note cards are kind of nice because then you're not going through pages and pages and pages of notes. All you have to do is just the note cards. So up to you how to do it, but that's, that's what I recommend. So this is like our, our recipe for adding and subtracting fractions. So the first thing you want to do is to make sure each individual fraction is simplified and reduced because this will mean your denominator is the smallest it can be. And that means that you're going to have less reducing if you, uh, further down the road. If you don't reduce first, your common denominators are gonna be very big and then you're gonna to have to do more work to reduce at the end. So we like to make sure the reduced first and then start combining. So make sure they're simplified. Then step two is to find that common denominator. So what we just did, you would be doing that as your second step. Step three is once you determine what that denominator has to be, you're creating that denominator for each fraction. And so um, you have to multiply the top and the bottom of each fraction by the same number, and that will create the denominator you want. And the number you multiply in each fraction will be different. So you're not gonna multiply every fraction by the same number, but inside, within each fraction, the top and the bottom is the same number. So I have an example here, um, A and B and C and D. So these are just numbers. Um, our common the denominator would have to have B and D. So the first fraction I have to multiply by D because the denominator does not have that value. And then the second fraction I have to multiply by B because it doesn't have that value. And so that makes the denominators the same. But in order to keep the, the fractions equal, we have to multiply the top as well because that means we're basically multiplying by one. So we're not changing the value of the fraction. We're just changing what it looks like, but it, it represents the same amount of stuff. So once you've gotten your common denominator, then you add the, the tops or you subtract the tops. If, whether it's addition or subtraction, you combine the tops of the fractions together and the denominator stays the same because we're not changing how many parts we have total. So the denominator stays the same. We're just 
changing how many we've combined together, but how they're divided is the same. And then once you get that answer, you reduce it. So I'm going to kind of ramp up. I'm going to start with problems where the denominators are already the same. So that way we can skip the first three steps and we're only doing steps four and five. And then we will uh, move on to more complicated where we need to get a common denominator. And all of these, I'm gonna have pairs and then we'll move on to if we're, we're combining like three fractions together. So I'm gonna kind of ramp up in, in difficulty here for you. So I've got two problems here, one on the left, one on the right. And um, I am involving some negatives in these because we're gonna be working a lot with whole number or with positive and negative numbers. And so um, the one downside is the textbook when it has the fraction part doesn't teach you how to do fractions with negatives. Um, it only uses positive numbers. And so I wanted to make sure you see how to do them with negatives as well so that you understand how that works because the textbook does not do that. So our first one here on the left, we've got negative nine over five plus one fifth. Now note that I have the directions here, simplify the following. A lot of students um, tend to ignore the words and when they see a math problem and they just look at the math. But that when you, when you have algebra, that's a mistake because those words are telling you what you're supposed to do. They're basically telling you kind of like what recipe you're supposed to follow. So if you don't read the words that come with the problem or the directions that comes with the problem, uh, it's going to get you in trouble later down the road because you'll see the same type of equation and there's different things we do to it. And so you wouldn't know which thing you're supposed to do until you read those directions. So the simplify the following, you need to know what that means. That word simplify means you're following the order of operations. So um, you really have to pay attention to the vocabulary in math and understand what each word means because that's telling you what to do. So simplify means that we want to follow the order of operations. So or following the order of operations, simplifying means that you're just, you're doing arithmetic, you're adding, you're subtracting, you're doing that kind of stuff. So we've got negative nine over five plus one over five. So I'm gonna start by rewriting this. And whenever you see a negative with a fraction, put the negative on top of the fraction. because our denominators need to be the same. And so a negative on the top of the fraction is, a, is the same thing as if it's in the middle of the fraction. It's the same thing if it's in the bottom of the fraction, but we're gonna put it on top. So when we are combining these, you're basically creating one fraction over five and the tops get combined. So this is equal to negative nine plus one over five. So you're just adding the tops of the fractions. So negative nine plus one is negative eight. And so we get negative eight over five. Normally I don't show that middle step where I put them on the same fraction, but it's very handy to understand that step because that's something that is used in college algebra. So you're just combining the tops of the fractions based off of what the symbols are telling you to do. And then that's your answer, as long as the denominator is the same. And then you reduce if possible. Now we cannot reduce in this case because eight and five don't have any numbers in common. So our final answer is negative eight over five. And that's an improper fraction because you've got the top larger than the bottom and that's okay. Generally, we're not gonna be working with mixed numbers. If you see mixed numbers, turn it into an improper fraction. Don't turn it into a mixed number. 
because once you get to algebra, we don't use mixed numbers. So leave it in this form. Their um, questions. No. So let's look at the one on the right then. We've got 11 over eight minus five, 11 over 18, sorry, <laughs> minus five over 18. So again, I'm just gonna write this and I just rewrite it, even if I'm not gonna do anything to it, I rewrite it just so that I'm not messing with the original problem. And so we're taking the tops and we're combining them with the denominator staying the same. So we have 11 minus five, which is six, and we get six over 18. Now, six over 18 is something that we can reduce because I can divide both of those numbers by two. I could also divide both of those numbers by three. Um, I could even divide them both by six because six goes into both of those. So we do need to reduce this value. So you can reduce it in multiple steps, but if you pick the right number, you can reduce it um, in one step. So I can divide the top and the bottom here by six. And so when I'm reducing, I write that down. I write down what I'm dividing the top and the bottom by. And I do it in another color so that it's clear, you know, that what I'm doing. And then I just divide going across. Six divided by six is one. 18 divided by six is three. And then that gives us our final answer. So always reduce your answer at the end to make sure that you've got it in its um, simplest form because part of simplify is to also reduce. And so that's part of, you know, order of operations you divide. And so that's part of the simplification process. So common denominator, if it's already set up that way, not so bad. You just have to do the math and you can even use a calculator. You know, I encourage you to do this mentally to kind of, um, you know, be able to do the math in your head with addition and subtraction because it's often faster than a calculator when you get good at it. Um, so I encourage you to practice that skill, but you are welcome to use a calculator. So here I've got two examples. Again, it says simplify. So we're going to be combining these together and these do not have common denominators. And so now we have to go through the full process, um, you know, see if we need to reduce them first, figure out what the common denominator is, and then um, go through, build it to the common denominator and so on. So these are gonna be more work. So they're gonna show more steps here. So the first one, we've got three over 16 plus one over two. So these numbers are small enough that if you know your times tables, you can figure out what the common denominator would be. So you're looking for a number that you can divide by 16 and divide by two. So if anybody, knows what that number is, you can say it out loud, you can type it in the chat, whatever um, is convenient for you. Repeat the question. What would be a number that both 16 and two can divide into? So the number is going to be bigger than two. So it's it's going to be at 16 least- 16 divided by two is eight. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so 16 also has to be divided into this number. So it's 32. 32 works. So um, 32 is a common denominator, 32 divided by 16 and 32 divided by two, both come out to whole numbers. So let me write that down. So we have a common denominator. Let's 
of 32. And you can get that by doing 16 times two. Why don't we always just multiply those denominators by the denominator in math? Why don't we just do that to come up with the common denominator? You can, but it's not always the smallest and it sometimes results in more work because the smallest is actually 16. So yeah, 16 works. I can make the, if I use 16, the second fraction is the only one I have to touch because the first fraction is already there. If I use 32, I have to change both fractions. So it's, it's more work, but it works every time. So if that's what you want to do, you can totally do that. That is totally cool. Okay. Yeah, so we've got technically the least common denominator is 16. So there are two different values you can use here. You can use 16 where you're only changing the, the second fraction because the first one's already there, or you can do 32 and change them both. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys. We can do it either way. Which denominator do you guys want to use? Let's do both of them. Yeah, and let's see what we come up with. <laughs> well, we can do that. Let me, in order to do that, I'm going to just duplicate my slide so that I can use the space on the other one. So, because I have a feeling I'm gonna need all of this space here if we do it both ways. So I just made a copy and we'll do that second problem on, on another slide. Okay, so let's do the 32 because that's the way that you guys came up with it first is to build it up to 32. So I've got three over 16 plus one over two. And then I always do this in another color. So the one with 16, we're gonna multiply by two. And the one with two, we're gonna multiply by 16. And so I make sure that I write down every number that I'm multiplying. If you only wrote times two and you didn't write it twice, technically what you wrote is not correct because that means you're multiplying by two and here we're really multiplying by two over two because we're multiplying the top and the bottom. So you do have to write it on the top and the bottom. Okay. Because otherwise it's two and three sixteens. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's not the same thing. In your head, you may do what the correct thing, but what you've written is not correct. Right. The yeah. one thing about math is that you have to write exactly what you mean because otherwise it's wrong, even if you got the right answer. So you have to pay attention to all of these little details. <laughs> <laughs> so when we multiply the first fraction, we get six over 32. And then the second fraction, you get 16 over 32. Plus 24 over 32. <laughs> Yeah, so we do six plus 16, which, you know, it's sad to say I can do that in my head, but I'm probably gonna mess it up. So I'll use my, my calculator. Uh, oh, 20, 22. Oh. 22. <laughs> 22. <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs> so um, that adds to 22. So we get 22 over 32, but now we have to reduce. Yeah. So, um, I know I can divide these both by two. If, it, if it's an even number, I can always divide by two. So if that's what I see, that's what I do. So I'm gonna divide top and the bottom by two. Uh, 11 over 16. And we got 11 over 16, that's correct. Okay. So now let's do it with the common denominator of 16. So you can see the difference. So if we're building it to 16, we only need to multiply the second fraction and we're gonna multiply it by eight so that we can, we can get up to 16. And the first fraction gets to stay the same. So how did you come up with the figure eight besides just knowing that 16 is divided by two is eight. How did you, so, you know that? How yeah. would you with eight? 
if you if you know what your common denominator is just divide it by the denominator mm -hmm. and that will tell you what number to multiply it by okay so the rule is whatever the other one is divide and that would be your common uh, yeah, it's not necessarily the other one. It's whatever you chose to use for your common denominator. So 16 in the point two would still give you the same answer? 16 in the two? Right. Still give you yeah. The same answer? yeah, we're going to get the same answer when we finish this. But we have to multiply this one by eight because we're trying to get a denominator of 16. And the only way to get to 16 if you start with two is to multiply it by eight. Makes sense. So when we do this multiplication, we're gonna get three over 16 and then we get eight over 16. 11 over 16. And we get 11 over 16. So you can see, same answer, but it was less steps. So we didn't have to reduce at the end because we used a smaller number. Okay. So you can choose to just multiply each one by the other denominator and just know that you may have to do a little bit extra work at the end. Otherwise you can try to find the smallest number and then use that one and eliminate some of the extra work. Hmm. So if you use you use a uh, point one twenty five, um, we would not want to use one hundred twenty five or or twenty five. You the number that you choose has to go evenly. Sixteen and two have to divide into it without um, any any hmm. decimal, basically. So you can't just use any number. You can only use specific numbers that come out to whole numbers when you divide them. So we could have used 64 because 16 goes into 64 and two goes into 64, but that's much larger. Yeah. And so that we, you know, that would be even more reducing. So it goes back to the table that you created, the first table. Uh, mm -hmm and um, finding the least common kind of denominator. Yeah, so if we did that table, um, two and 16, and we did times one, times two, and so on, three, four. we'd have to do this a lot <laughs> because we have to go all the way up to eight. But if you fill out that table, right, we have four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. And 16 would be the first one that you would find that they both multiply to. Makes sense. Yeah, Thank you. so uh, 16 times three. I don't really know my, my 16s, so I'm gonna just kind of end it there. <laughs> so yeah, so that's why 16 is the smallest, but as long as both, whatever number you pick, 16 and two can divide into it, you can use it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So did this one. So this next one is 12 over 35 minus one over 10. So we can do this both ways as well. We can do it by multiplying um, by what the first fraction by 10 and the second one by 35. And then we can also do it by trying to find the smallest number that they both uh, go into. Ooh, so the smallest number is five, isn't it? Well, yeah, five divides into both of these, but we're looking for the smallest that they, that. This is where it gets confusing because we want the smallest number that they divide into, which means the number has to be bigger than them. So it's the smallest, biggest, bigger number that they divide into. That the denominator divide into. Yes. The smallest number the denominator divide into. 
yeah so if we may go ahead yeah we we can do um like that multiplication table again two so if we multiply 10 times two we've got 20 35 times two is 70 10 it's times three is 70. 30 it because would be 70 70 yes and that is going to be the smallest oh so, wow yes okay so 70 if you do the times table right is is going to be the least common denominator so we'll do it both ways we'll do it with where we're multiplying both fractions and then we'll do it with using 70 so you can see the difference okay so um if we use the first method where we just multiplied each fraction by the other denominator i'll do that one first this is going to give us a denominator 350. So it's going to be a very big denominator. Mm -hmm. So I have to multiply the first one by 10 and the second one by 35. So that's 120 over 350, 350 minus 35 over 350. 350. Mm -hmm. Definitely need a calculator for this one. I'm not doing this in my head. 15 <laughs> left over, so negative 15, 85. 85. Good job. <laughs> Keep those math skills. <laughs> it still can be broken down. So you still have to find the yes. number. Mm -hmm. So we've got to reduce it. And if it ends in a five or a zero, you can always divide it by five. By five. Right. So doing this kind of math is kind of like you're doing a puzzle because you're right. you're really just trying to think what do I know and where do it I go? From there? Active, it does definitely. So 85 yeah. divided by five is 17 because thank you, calculator. <laughs> and 70 is the bottom. We get 70. And 17 is a prime number, so it's not going right. to reduce any further. So that's the so that's the answer. Number. That's yes. the simplified number. 17 That's the simplified. over 70s. Wow. So how would you convert that back? Oh, you don't convert it. You don't. You just leave no. it the way it is. Yeah. Okay. You can't yeah. go no more. Don't do any extra work. Don't try to make it harder than it is. <laughs> <laughs> so if we used a common denominator of 70 instead... Mm -hmm. we would have to do 10 times 7 because that's what our multiplication table is basically telling us and then 35 times 2 or to convert them both to 70 yes at least denominator. so you're basically kind of getting it off of the multiplication table if you use that method right so then we got 24 minus 7 24 over 70 yes I just wrote 35. That's not right. <laughs> 24 over 70. We have 7 over minus 70. 7 over 70. And so then you just do 24 minus 7. 17 over 70. Yep. More simpler. Yes. You have to do a little more work at the beginning to figure out what the smallest number is, but then it does pay off because then you have fewer steps later. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, hopefully you guys are seeing that fractions are not as scary as they seem. Yeah, after 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you understand how fractions work and like how the rules work, it's really not so bad. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Yeah. I actually prefer fractions to decimals because I find doing math with decimals much harder to oh, do. Yeah. I can do I fractions that. like in my head for the most part, but decimals I can't. Yeah, because you have to convert the decimal point. And yeah, and then you have to like carry numbers if you start subtracting. Numbers. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> rounding, and sometimes you have to divide, and it's yep. like wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> so I like fractions better. Ah, geez, I guess that's just difference in humans. Yes, everybody's different. <laughs> Some people see decimals and think money. And so, yeah, if, you, know. you know, it depends mm -hmm. on how you look at it. 
Like yeah. I'm, I'm really good at multiplying by 13 because I play a lot of card games and oh. card games, you have 13 cards in a suit. So it's mm-hmm. made me really good at 13. <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, you, you brought that up, Stephanie. Mm-hmm. And in the in your introduction part, one of the parts was about square roots and how to do square oh, roots, yeah. Izzy. And in my discussion, I asked even um, if you put if you use I think thirteen and six in the formula that you're using for square roots, doing easy square roots, uh, it doesn't seem like it works. It doesn't work as well. Yeah, you can't take a square root of 13. Um, and, okay. you know, and six doesn't really come out nicely either. Right. So they, they have to be numbers that, you know, are squared that, you know, is the same thing multiplied, like two times two, Rectal three answer. times three, you know. Um, other numbers, any other square root, it just comes out gross. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, so, so, square so it's only numbers. those numbers that you're talking about. Yes. yes. Okay, 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 okay. All right, now I get it because mm-hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't. So you say you can't square root prime numbers. Right. You'd have to get yeah. a decimal, and usually, yeah. once we, I mean, we're not going to deal. We'll do those a little bit at the end of the class here. Um, instead of writing it in the decimal form, because they're prime numbers, when you take the square root, you get decimals that go on forever and there's no pattern. So they're kind of like pi, or they just go on forever. So instead of actually yeah. writing it out, we leave it written as a square root. Yeah. Because yeah. we don't want to bother trying to write out as many decimals as possible. It's just not, not worth it. <laughs> Right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So let's do this one that I have here because we've got three numbers to kind of show you what we do because everything we've done is two numbers. So now we've got three and we've got adding and subtracting going on here. Um, so we've got one half plus two thirds minus five twelfths. So when you're looking for a common denominator, you have to take all three of the numbers into account. So what denominators are you guys thinking we might be able to use? 12. We could use 12, yep. We could use 24. Right. Um, any, any multiple of 12, basically. Because, you know, that's the largest number. So whatever the biggest number in the denominator. What about 36? Ca- 36 would work as well, yes. So 12 is the easiest one. That's going to save us the most work. So. That will allow us, we only have to move the first two fractions and the last one can stay the same. So let's do 12. So um, I have to multiply Mm -hmm. by six in the first fraction to get to 12. Mm -hmm. And then the second one has to be four to get to 12. So this so will the give us will be half. Yeah. Six over twelve plus eight over twelve minus five over twelve. Uh, now you want to be careful. A lot of people that are like, oh, let me reduce these. Don't reduce because then you undo everything that you just did. So, <laughs> so reduce at the end. Reduce at the end. Yeah. If you do it too soon, you're just gonna go back to where you were and then you're like, oh. <laughs> So we have to do this left to right. So we have to do six plus eight first, and then we subtract five. Okay. So six plus eight is 14. 14 over 12. And so we got 14 over 12 12. minus five over 12. And then 14 minus five is nine. nine. over 12. You can still break that down. So it's three fourths. Yes, that is correct. So we can divide by three. 9 over 12. And that gives us 3 fourths as our answer. Okay. So. Okay. 
So um, if you wanted to, if you didn't want to use like 12 as your denominator and you were trying to figure out, well, what if I just multiplied by like all the numbers, you would have to multiply multiple times. Like you would be like, okay, multiply the first fraction by three and 12, the second fraction by two and 12 and the third one by two and three, basically. If you mm -hmm. want to do it that way without thinking about a common denominator, you'd have to multiply it by the, all of the other denominators. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. So finding the smallest one saves you work, especially when you have multiple fractions involved. Mm -hmm. And since 512 stand alone, the first two, um, and you have to add those two to bring those two together to, um, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and, and we did the first two first only because we have to go left to right. Right. So if the 512 was in the middle, then we would have the 512s first, um, you know, in the first step. It's just whatever you've got a whole bunch of stuff added, subtracted, you just always go left to right. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are other questions. What, what are you, are you just doing the um, um, fractions right now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're almost at an hour. It takes an hour just to do this. I'm not going to do anything more. <laughs> Mine would not connect earlier. And I, I went back to try and I finally got in. Um, your oh, ebook? They sent the codes. Yeah, they sent the codes for the ebook. I know that this was the first time we've had issues with the ebook. And so they had to resend everybody codes because it got messed up on vital sources part, not our side, but their side. I clicked on earlier and I don't know what was going I couldn't connect for some reason. Okay. And I, I started going through the week one assignment mm -hmm. and then I went back to try to connect and it connected. Okay. I, um, I don't know why I just stopped sharing because I want to share my screen. I was going to bring up ConnectVent. <laughs> I love your backdrop. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got to, you know, it's December and it is yeah. hasn't snowed yet where I'm living. So I'm trying to pretend that it's winter because it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> it doesn't snow where I am. I'm in Louisiana. It does not snow here. Yeah, so. I mean, <laughs> we get an average of eight days of snow a year and it's usually yeah. not a lot. So <laughs> I used to live in Michigan that. and I used to live where we had 300 inches of snow. So I, I it's been a big wow. change. <laughs> wow. We used to live in Alaska, so. Oh, that's a big change. Wait, yeah, well, not for a long period of time, just military duty. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, if you guys are having other issues with the ebook or things aren't connecting, there's actually in Connect Math this ebook button. So this is an alternative way, to, but I don't like this ebook as much as the Vital Source one, but it's there. So it that's yeah. the one I use. Yeah, so you can use this button instead of the Vital Source. Uh, Vital source is nice because you can use it on your phone. This doesn't work on the phone. Huh. But um, just wanted to kind of point oh that out God. that there is this Jeez. other button here that you can use. Wow. So, okay. and then um, just when you guys take your screenshots, you have to click on the grade book and then take the screenshot. Um, Wait, say it again. Okay. So, the, the the grades in connect math like they don't go into the blackboard grade book mm -hmm. um so in order for us to like give you points for your homework you have to take a screenshot right so yeah so you'd have to do that from the grade book page which i'm not going to show because it will show everybody's grades and we don't want to do that <laughs> okay um so on the on the page where we have like our homework listing mm -hmm. whatever and we can just screenshot that because it has our scores on it, right? Yeah, you can also screenshot yeah, this. Yeah. But um, it, you may not be able to get all of them on the web. Let's see. Yeah, you can get all four of them on here. So you can screenshot this as well. Okay, that's yeah. what I did. I screenshot yeah, that and then I did my quiz separately. Yes. And then the quiz, you have to submit your work on paper so we can give you partial credit because. Wait a, wait a minute. minute. Wait a minute. Okay. I know. Wait, wait a, a minute. minute. <laughs> I, I'm I really good. I'm really good. I'm really 
backed up here. Now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> wow. So, so, um, you know, be, so should I back up to the screenshot thing again or <laughs> where do I, where do we, yeah, back up? I'm trying to follow you. I'm, I just okay. went back into my class course content. Mm-hmm. I need to get on my desktop. Okay. Oh, on my God. weekly content, mm-hmm. I'm going to mathematical operations, week one. Yes. I went through Access Your Ebook, beginning algebra. Mm-hmm. And now I'm supposed to upload my math work. Not for the homework, but just, for the quiz. just for the quiz. Wait a minute. Okay. Doing this on paper. Okay. So the homework, you know, and it says access, connect math, all of that, all the homework that you're doing, you can do that. You want to do it on paper anyway, because uh, you want to have it as part of your notes, but you don't turn that, the homework, what's in paper for the homework, you only turn in as a picture of your grades. Oh, um, which would be like, you could take a screenshot of this page and it will give us the, the score that you earned. Oh, and, okay. And then what we do. Assignment. Yes. I turn, as I do and that's paper. right here. Yeah. Okay. So the week one connect math, that's where you, you would click here. You would upload the file through this. And then your score will be the average of the four uh, uh, homeworks there. So we just okay. take the average score and then that's what you will get here. Okay. So do that first. And then after you do all the homeworks and you're ready, then you take your quiz. So if your quiz is right here. And you know, when you're taking the quiz, you're going to want to write down your stuff on paper while you're working it out. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Make sure that you number the problem that you're working on. So that way, oh, you know, you know <laughs> you'll get used to it. It's not that it, it's not as bad as it sounds. Well, I did the quiz, but I didn't write down the, I didn't take the picture. You just wrote down the problems and did. Do you still have your paper with them? Um, probably not. Okay. Well, um, you should be able to view the quiz and maybe you can reproduce your work. Do the quiz again? Um. (laughs) Oh, yeah <laughs> yeah I, I yeah i mean there's because uh, you have to turn that in that's that's uh okay. part of this right here so right, so one know. thing is never throw at any quiz work because you never know if you're going to need that to study for a midterm or a final so just as a general rule never mm. throw anything out during a course oh my goodness so um yeah. you know so when you take the quiz you're doing it on paper writing your work and everything mm-hmm. and then you take a picture of it. You can use your phone to take a picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you upload the images to Blackboard. Okay. And, and you can do that from your phone because there's a Blackboard app. So you can just upload it through the Blackboard app. Um, it will take a while to upload because usually the pictures are big. So you have to let it sit there for like 10, 15 minutes to make sure that it uploads everything. That's like you can upload from your phone. The pictures from yes, your phone. yes. And you can upload more than one file. So, um, and you can do it, you know, like, okay, let's say I'm going to just do it from my computer here. Let's, okay, here are two images. So you can just select one and you can do open and then you can browse again and pick the second image so that it has multiple. So you can upload multiple pictures at once and then you hit submit and then it'll upload. So I'll just hit submit here. Um, and so, yeah, it will go to me. And so then I will take a look at your work and then I can give you points back. So if you made a mistake, like let's say you were adding your fractions and you made an error and accidentally added wrong, but the rest of your work is good. I can give you points back because in connect math, it only gives you right or wrong. Um, doesn't give partial credit. So this is how we're having you submit your work for the quiz so you can get partial credit. Okay. Okay. Yes. Then it makes sense now. Yes. Oh my. So I just redo it. Yes. (laughs) Unfortunately, but now that you know, like I, I have this in the announcements, but I know it's so much going on and you know, it's in the weekly content, but 
again, there's just so much in the first week that it's hard to, you know, keep track of all of that. So yeah, so that's, and that's uploaded down at the bottom right here. Okay. And then every week is the same thing. So once you've done it for one week, then you know what to do. We're not going to throw any curveballs at you. Every week's going to be basically the same. Okay. Really? So. <laughs> well, the, expecting it. the math will be different, ball. but you know, what you, what you have to do, you've already, you've always got these four assignments that are graded. Um, and you've got the videos that you can watch the optional assignments students are really good for studying. So if you're, you know, if you need some extra practice, like if you, if the problems are not enough and you want extra practice, you can do the optional assignments. But they're not required. That's why they're called optional. Okay. Wow. Well, I guess I better catch up to everything today. <laughs> <laughs> what I recommend that you do is don't do everything at once. Um, do a little bit every day. You know, spend like an yeah. hour a day. Because then it's more manageable. You're not sitting here doing like five hours of work or 10 hours of work or whatever on a weekend. You know, if you do an hour or two hours a day, um, it's a lot easier. And, and then you have a better idea of where you're at. And um, math is one of those things that you just have to, the only way to learn it is to practice. So if you work mm -hmm. on it daily, it's better practice wise than to cram. So because cramming, it doesn't stay in your brain long, but if you do a little bit every day, it, it's, it, it just sticks better. <laughs> so. Wow. It's good on my quiz too. Oh my. So it won't let you take this quiz a second time. What it will say is like view. And so oh, it will open up the quiz that you took and you just have to rewrite your work. Oh, just rewrite the work. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I can do that. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Okay. Mm. I can start that today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not as bad as it seems. And then if you guys have to take college algebra, college algebra is set up very similarly. Um, it's a, it's a different thing. You know, I don't know why they have some people do college algebra first, because this is like, yeah. to kind of help you with that class. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> what is this algebra? This is called this is fundamentals. Oh my. It's the basics. Yeah, it's the basics. It's to make sure you have the basics down so that way when you get to college algebra, you at least know some of it and you're not like thrown in the deep end. Oh, okay. I guess. I I don't know. They don't set my all my classes up by themselves. What are you studying, Jamie? studying business administration ah you have to take algebra, algebra. they require that yeah. one okay. yeah. but i came i the only think i didn't transfer my credits but i've uh, been in college before so i just didn't have time to transfer my credits and do everything that's, that's unfortunate <laughs> you should do no. that because that will save you i'm starting over from scratch <laughs> <laughs> sometimes that's actually, actually a good idea because then if you've forgotten anything right it's a refresher kind of, yeah mm -hmm. wow <laughs> yeah. what about yourself what are you studying i'm studying engineering management and technology Woo. you're gonna have a lot of math so yeah. mm -hmm. you're gonna have to take pre-calculus um mm -hmm. they might have you take calculus so you got a lot of math ahead of you so it's a good thing you're starting here <laughs> yeah because <laughs> i get the basics <laughs> I've been out of school almost 40 years and when I was in college was like 35 years ago and yeah and it was nothing like it is today <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. right <laughs> nothing so I'm pretty I know I need to start all over from the fundamentals mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah kind of get this down first um, from the fundamental. Yeah, it's amazing how much you can forget because when I went to grad school, I had a gap of four years and I had forgotten stuff and I had to retake classes. I was like, that was only four years and I still forgot some of the math that I had learned. So, <laughs> you know, your biography was interesting. <laughs> I've had an interesting journey, that's for sure. <laughs> you made me almost think, how am I going to trust her being my teacher? <laughs> the intent <laughs> i know what i'm doing 
going? I, I swear. <laughs> no, because you was talking about how you didn't like math. You weren't interested in math. I hated it. And but it clicked. And once it clicked, I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I I listened to that and I hit re I backed up and rewind to make sure I was hearing what I was hearing. <laughs> so we no, I mean, it, I know what you guys are going through because I was there. <laughs> I love math. I, I really do. I like math. So it's, I plan to, yeah. uh, this would be the one course that I, sh I shouldn't have problems with, with my schedule. Mm -hmm. I think I could deal with this one easier. Yeah. I'll see. Yep. Yeah. I work a um, I work a night shift, twelve hours. Oh my! So. I do too. That's why I can get my work done at overnight when I'm at work. I work for the credit union, and I'm telling you, the so I deal with unions the open at night. Yeah, our customer service is open twenty four seven. Yeah, so I'm dealing with numbers all the time, all the time. And so I'm just like being at work overnight, it helps me to be able to get this work done when it's slow. Mm -hmm. So I, <laughs> I take that time because I'm also a single mom too. So I don't have time. And even though my kids are, they're big kids, they're teenagers and stuff, but still in all, it gives me, I can focus my time in the daytime on other stuff. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all about finding the, the schedule that works for you and trying to fit school in around everything else that's going on. Right. And it's hard. It requires, you know, sacrifices to try to do both, but it's it's worth it at the end because it it's will, it. you know, make you go further in your degree. It opens doors. There's so many jobs out there that require degrees and mm -hmm. it's very rare to get away with not having a degree and getting a job where you want to do these days. You know, you, it's very hard to do that. And it's so true. That's what got me back in school. Mm -hmm. I topped out and the engineering manager came to me. Uh, they tried to get me on the engineering team, but HR would not. Yes, because you know they're, they're like, even if you had the experience, we want that degree. And so you're, you're, yeah, yeah. My yeah. uncle, he's an engineer, never got any formal training. He just everything was learned on the job, but that doesn't happen these days. Right, that is so neat. nowadays, and you have to have a track record. Yep, we gotta have a track record. Now, my sister, she's an accountant and she doesn't have an accounting degree. She got she's one of the lucky ones that managed to do wow. without a degree. Um, but she also works for a very small mom and pop place, which is probably the only reason that she was able to get in is she had enough experience um doing cashier work and then kind of ended up in the back. She used to work at Legoland and started doing payroll and stuff like that as an assistant. So she learned it on the job and, um, you know, she can get away with that at a small company, but if she tried to go somewhere bigger, I, you know, and, and that was one of the reasons why she left Legoland is because they decided that they needed people to have actual degrees, even though she knew everything. And so she had to find something else. Right. Wow. That's the way. Yep. That is the way. It was yeah. great speaking with you guys. I'm going yeah. to go to this was up. this was fantastic. I love how interactive you guys were and everything. Like this was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So we can remain. Are we doing this every week? Like yes, this? every week. So, and so and if this is a good time, we can keep it at this time every week. Okay. So from your survey, I'm, I'm gathering this is what you concluded. Uh, yeah. This this Saturday. is what I concluded okay. from um, what I saw what I checked earlier, the results may have changed. Let me see if I can bring up the survey and see what the latest, I have too many things open. <laughs> Let's see what's the survey results currently showing. Oh, I didn't do a survey. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> Let's see. I've only got eight responses on the survey so far. So not, not a lot. <laughs> but five out of those eight do say one o'clock to works that this time works. So we'll probably stick keep it at this time. Yeah, keep it right here. 
It's really? Oh yeah. my god. Yes. Is it a bad time for you? Are you? I work six thirty p.m. to seven a.m. Oh, I, I so hate you have to seven. sleep and then wake up and then go back mm-hmm. to sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I just had to ch- I set my alarm. Mm-hmm. That's all. Yeah. But that's, uh, yeah. We'll see as, if more people do the survey. Eight is not a lot of people, but that's, that's the, the vote so far. Yeah. <laughs> One o'clock. Wow. I guess I could I, I I just I just keep going until see what happens. Yeah, I would at least go to sleep for a couple hours and then. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Well, right. I'm going to do my notations or I'll redo my math work and I'll submit it as such. Yes, I'm okay. gonna go into the discussions and start seeing how many replies we have with the extra credit from yesterday so (laughs) (laughs) i am anticipating a lot of replies (laughs) what is um what is uh gosh my thought fell out of my head when will the we can anticipate the grades being uh, so um grades are always done wednesdays thursdays and fridays okay so yeah so those days I'm like hold up doing all of my grading and then like Mondays and Tuesdays are when I do my outreach and I start emailing people and be like you've got missing work or this kind of stuff so that's kind of how my schedule goes is that Mondays and Tuesdays I'm reaching out to people Wednesdays through Fridays I am doing the grading okay thank and you I, yeah I usually do the discussions last so because people like to have their quiz work stuff first. So I'll, I'll do that stuff first. And so the discussions usually end up getting graded on Friday, just as an FYI. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, y'all All right. have a continued good weekend. Yeah, you guys you too. have a great time. Um, I'll see you guys at the next live. <laughs> All right. <then>. All right. <laughs> Take care. Y'all too. Bye-bye. Bye.